Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Third Baptist Church and worship on this Sunday morning. The theme for today, as you will have seen, continues our idea of journeys, and this time it is St. Paul's fateful journey from the Near East to Rome, and of course there is the catastrophic journey on the way. I don't think I need to explain that to all of you, but if you look at the anthem, you'll see that the title of the anthem are actually Paul's words, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, just of the ship. And it's the solo which David will sing is taken from a uh, not a very familiar cantata, a really wonderful piece by Sir George Dyson, and it's called St. Paul's Journey to Melita. And I make this point because Melita is the ancient name of Malta. So we all know this as Paul's shipwreck on the island of Malta, and I didn't want you writing to me and saying you had a massive misprint. It is actually correct, St. Paul's journey to Melita. Okay, so with that being said, um, we'll begin our worship now with David and Lansin performing a very beautiful piece. Again, this idea, the analogy of journeys and our life's journey as much as anything else. Never weather beaten sail, more willing bent to shore. Good morning, everyone here in the sanctuary and online. Uh, I was asked to say the welcome this morning, and what I decided to do was go out and look at our website, and it actually has on there something called a grand welcome, and I want to read it to you. It says, Third Baptist Church in St. Louis is a unique and historic church located in a dynamic urban arts and education district probing new pathways of service and changing a world. Third is a richly diverse family, embracing a wide variety of ethnicities, ages, life situations, and doctrinal opinions. Third is called to minister, love, serve, and remain in our city for good. You know what? That sounds a lot like you and me. Um, what I found when I came to third and my family found when we came to third was a group of people who were curious enough to ask the why questions. And they were humble and loving enough and courageous enough to admit that they didn't have all the answers 
to all of those questions. But what they were willing to do was to walk alongside me and my family in this journey of faith in Jesus Christ. Together, for that, I am grateful. And so I welcome you to and from Third Baptist Church here at Grand Center. Secure in his prophetic strength, the water peril o'er, the many gifted man at length stepped on the promised shore. He trod the shore, but not to rest, nor wait till angels came. Lo, humblest pains the saint attest, the firebrands and the flame. But when he, but when he felt the viper's smart, then instant aid was given, Christian, Hence learn to do thy part and leave the rest to heaven. Scripture reading is from 2 Timothy 4, 6, 7. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith.
Psalms chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Jehovah also will be a high tower for the oppressed, a high tower in times of trouble, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Jehovah, hast not forsaken them that seeks thee. should have hearkened unto me, and not have lost from creed, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you. But of the sheep stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve saying For Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be 
even as it was told me. How be it we must be cast upon a certain island. Well, David, Brent, and Lanson have beautifully presented the pathos and the story of one of the most remarkable stories, not, in the, not only in the Bible, but in all of ancient literature. As I present this sermon this morning, I encourage you to do a little bit of homework. It'll be worth your time. Take a moment and read Acts 20 all the way through. The sermon I'm about to present echoes what you have just heard musically and mirrored through this remarkable story in the book of Acts. We'll begin with the background which led to the shipwreck. Well, Paul believed his third missionary journey was over. And before departure from Greece, Paul dictated a letter to Tertius and asked Phoebe to deliver upon her return to Rome. Paul informed the believers in Rome, I am traveling to the Jerusalem church, delivering an offering to the poor. This letter became one of the most influential documents in human history, the letter of Paul to the Romans. And Paul says, and I will visit Rome on my way back. I long to see you and share a gift with you. But I want you to know afterwards, my heart's desire is to bring the gospel west to Spain. Paul's farewell to the fellowship in Greece was very emotional. Many tears were shed on both sides. Paul saying, I don't think we'll ever see one another again in this life. It was that type of goodbye. Paul's return to Jerusalem offered an opportunity to connect with various fellowships and Christian groups. And as he got closer to Jerusalem, as he stopped off in Tyre and Phoenicia and the port city of Caesarea, after all of this journey, all of this way, all of the Christian groups had one message to Paul, that is this, don't go to Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, you may be killed. Rumors are spreading, Paul, that you encourage Jewish converts not to follow the law or practice circumcision. Here was the question again that threatened the very existence of our faith. The question which divided the early church. 
do you need to be Jewish in order to follow Christ? The Jerusalem church said yes. Paul said no. Peter said no, then yes. Paul's response to the concerns by his friends, I am ready to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. His friends blessed him, sent him on his way, and said, the Lord's will be done. Paul arrived in Jerusalem and visited with James and all the elders of the Jerusalem church. Can you imagine that meeting? And Paul sat down and reviewed all the victories from his missionary journey. He sat down and passionately explained all the joys, all the, conver all the conversions. And the leaders responded, Oh, thanks be to God! But Paul, we got a problem. And they quickly changed the subject. My brother Paul, you have stirred things up in our city. We've got big problems. Paul, do you know in Jerusalem there are thousands of Jewish converts and they believe you are teaching Jewish Christians not to follow Moses or the law. And Scripture says, Paul, you do what we tell you to do. We have a plan to fix this. Paul, you are to join four others who are going through the Jewish rite of purification. And part of this rite involves, Paul, shaving your head and those of the four others. Then, Paul, we want you to go to the temple several times and be very noticeable and let others see that you, rehab, you have respect for the law. And Paul did it, and it seemed to be working. However, on the seventh day, visiting the temple, Jewish pilgrims from Asia noticed Paul and turned a crowd of worshipers in this temple to a mob. Here is Paul. Here is the one that's teaching against the law. Here is Paul that is blaspheming the holy temple. How is Paul blaspheming the temple? Well, you know, these group of pilgrims from Asia, they saw Paul walking in, the, in Jerusalem with a Gentile. So naturally, those that want to stir things up will communicate half-truths. And they said to those who were gathered in the temple, I'll bet you... Paul has brought a Gentile into the inner courts. And I know in our modern mind we're thinking, all right, somebody went into the inner courts and he's a Gentile. What's the big deal? Well, it was punishable by death. The mob grabbed Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And Paul was rescued by a Roman commander stationed at the Antonia Fortress, located on the temple grounds. If you ever see a map of the temple, the fortress was built by Herod to protect the temple and house the Roman soldiers. This, temp this fortress was held up by four huge columns, one soaring up 165 feet above the temple. When Satan tempted Jesus, do you remember? When he said, Jesus, climb to the top of the temple, jump off and let others save you, this was the reference. The Roman officers rescued Paul from the mob just in time. And they placed him in the fortress. And they put him in chains. And Paul said, take these chains off of me. And they responded, you're a prisoner. And then Paul played his trump card. I am a Roman citizen. And they stood back and they took the chains off. In order to ease the tensions, the commander ordered Paul to meet with the Jewish leaders. Imagine walking into this meeting. 
Paul began to argue his point, and after a few moments, the high priest cut him off. And he said to those standing beside Paul, punch him in the mouth. Paul responded by telling the, the high priest, God will strike you, you whitewash wall. Don't call somebody a whitewash wall. That's not good. That's essentially saying you're dirty. You're unclean, and you just cover it up with a thin coat of paint. Those standing near Paul said, Paul, how dare you insult this high priest? And Paul said, oh, I would never insult someone who is truly a high priest. The meeting descended into shouting matches and more chaos, and the Roman authorities took Paul back to the fortress. It was discovered the next day that 40 people took a religious vow to assassinate Paul. The plot was discovered by the son of Paul's sister, and he tipped off the Roman commander. So the Romans decided to move Paul from the Antonia Fortress in Jerusalem to the seaport city of Caesarea. A military escort accompanied Paul, 200 soldiers, 70 cavalrymen, and 200 bowmen. Paul arrived in Caesarea and discovered his fate was in the hands of a Roman prefect 